Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sam Ellis. Uh, I'm Associate Head of BMUS at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, and I'm very pleased to be welcoming you to this evening's exchange talk. Before I introduce tonight's speaker any further, I'm just going to say a few things about the format and about the technology. So the talk will last around half an hour, and then there'll be some time for questions after that. We won't go on any later than uh, 7 p.m. because of course that's when I need to go and listen to the answers. You can use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You can find that by sort of hovering around with your mouse at the bottom of the screen, bring the chat function up. You can use that throughout the talk um, and you'll find a link in there to the live captions as well for tonight's talk. Um, and our thanks to Louisa McDade who is doing the captioning for us this evening. At the bottom of this Zoom screen as well, you'll find access to a Q&A function and you can use that to ask any questions as we go. We'll save all of those up for the Q&A session at the end. And if you wish, you can even upvote your favourite questions to make sure that we address those ones first. I'll be monitoring those two things, the chat and the Q&A, during the talk so that we can let our speaker get on with the speaking. Now, I'm especially pleased to be introducing Brianna, who is a greatly valued colleague, central to teaching music history and music theory at the RCS. But of course, an equally important facet of her role as lecturer in historical musicology and of her, her academic profile in general is the fact that she's a scholar of the 18th century and of historically informed performance. In 2016, she completed her PhD with the benefit of the University of Glasgow College of Arts Internship Scholarship, and she's now also the Music Research Associate for the AHRC-funded project, the edited collection of Alan Ramsey. But her work is certainly not limited to these shores. She's twice been a visiting fellow at the University of Sydney, and she's currently working on a book to be published soon by Routledge. Tonight, we're hearing a tale of two sopranos. And interestingly, for all of us involved in music education, it's specifically a tale of the musical training of these two women. And, you know, while our students hopefully learn a lot from us, sometimes we allow ourselves to bask in our association with a star pupil. And there's nothing new in that, as I think we're about to find out. So, Brianna, over to you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, just give me one moment while I share my screen with you all. Okay, uh, so thank you very much to Sam Ellis for that uh, uh, wonderful introduction. Today, as Sam has introduced, I'm going to be talking about the tale of two sopranos and did they train with Venanzio Rauzzini, the father of a new style in English singing. Now, first of all, I would like to extend my warmest thanks to the RCS exchange team, especially Stephanie Edwards for facilitating the series and to Sam for chairing tonight's session. What I will be presenting comes from one of the chapters of my current book project, due to be published with Routledge next year. My book investigates this man, Venanzio Rauzzini, who was an opera singer, composer, impresario, and singing teacher in the latter half of the 18th century. He settled in Bath in 1778 where he became the director of the popular Bath concert series. He originally hailed from Camerino, a central eastern town in Italy, but he was trained and likely castrated in Rome. However, there has been a bit of, dare I say it, fake news spread about Rauzzini, both in his lifetime and even today. Of the most recent, it is suggested that he was not a castrato at all. And we can actually find this source uh, right here in uh, my favorite place to look, Wikipedia, where you can see that it's suggested that he potentially suffered from an endocrine condition. 
Now, this actually comes from a, a Guardian article, which was published in 2010, where they interviewed a supposed expert on Routzini. Now, the reference comes from an article uh, published in The Guardian written to promote a concert celebrating Routzini at Bath Abbey. And this is what it says. Local Routzini expert Raymond Herrinks, a retired opera singer, suggests that Routzini could not have been castrated and that his unnatural voice was entirely natural. Indeed, Herrinks believed Routzini suffered from an endocrine condition that prevented his voice from breaking. And a few years later, he made the same claim during an interview on the BBC Early Music show. And he says this, the bass baritone Raymond Herrinks, who is something of a Routzini expert, believes that Routzini's prowess in the bedroom might suggest that he wasn't actually a castrato at all, but a natural male soprano, rather like Radu Marian or Michael Manici, whose voices both feature in the programme. Catherine and Raymond visit Bath Abbey, the site of Routzini's grave and memorial plaque. Now, I'm sure all of us are thinking the same thing at this point. Where is the evidence? Well, when it comes to castrati, there's very little evidence about the operation, who underwent it, how many survived it, or its long-term effects. John Rosselli has provided one of the most detailed accounts as to why castrati became a popular phenomenon in opera. How they were created, uh, how they were created, however, was based on hearsay, with Rosselli noting the following. People gossiped about operations that had supposedly failed to castrate a boy fully. One such is documented. The boy had been, quote, castrated on one side only, close quote, so that as he turned, his voice broke. We, however, hear of deaths caused by castration. Such deaths may have happened and may have gone unreported in times when early death and death through medical error were common. But the impression one gets about the operation was a routine one. Now, Patrick Barbier, John Potter and Martha Feldman have extensively investigated the castrato's history but there is still little definitive evidence for the castration operation itself. There are no account books, no logs, and no registers of boys who were operated on. Even 18th century histor music historian Charles Burney tried to find out more information during his Italian tour. He was unsuccessful in his venture, noting, I inquired throughout Italy at what place boys were chiefly qualified for singing by castration, but could get no certain intelligence. I was told at Milan that it was Venice, at Venice that it was at Bologna, but at Bologna the fact was denied and I was referred to Florence, from Florence to Rome and from Rome I was sent to Naples. The operation most certainly is against the law in all these places as well as against nature and all the Italians are so much ashamed of it that every province they transfer it to some other. John Potter, in his article, The Tenor Castrato Connection, discusses the possible physical changes to a castrato's appearance. He notes that it's likely a castrato grew taller than the average man. His limbs may appear longer and his chest larger, but these changes depend on the endocrinology of the individual. There are several contemporary images of castrati performing at the opera, and these show little difference between a castrato and a normal man. Caricatures, however, frequently exaggerate their physical stature. On the left, we see the castrato Senesino in a fight between his two prima donnas, Francesca Cazzoni and Faustina Bardoni. He is a little taller than the two sopranos, but he does not tower over the top, as the left-hand image would have us believe. In this image, the two castrati stand a full head and shoulders over the soprano, further accentuated by the large plumage mounted on their head. Caricatures such as this were not unusual for the time. Now here is an image of Rautsini performing alongside his student, Katerina Schindlerin. If we compare the heights of the two, what do we see? 
they appear to be of similar height. But that does not necessarily mean Rautsini was or was not a castrato. Other physical differences that differentiated a castrato from the average man was the lack of facial hair and a generally more youthful appearance. In these images, Rautsini does not appear to have facial hair, but I'm fully aware it can be difficult to trust 18th century iconography, since it largely depends on the artist and the subject. There were all kinds of cosmetic wizardry which could have given Rautsini his angelic, youthful appearance, including shaving, makeup and wigs, which we know were fashionable at the time. And this is where the whole debate gets very tricky. In the 18th century, the science wasn't advanced enough to study the effects of castration or indeed any other genetic abnormality. We and we certainly don't have access to Rautsini's body to carry out a post-mortem. So all we have for a posthumous or retrospective diagnosis is iconography and vague contemporary accounts. I realise I have not as yet spoken about the two sopranos who are the subject of this talk, but I am drawing attention to this issue to demonstrate the kind of attention the castrato has already received how his image and popularity continues to elicit interest and debate, and why it is important con to consider how these 18th century sources were viewed by the audience of the time. Herrings is correct to question whether Rautsini was castrated, but he bases his theory on the idea that he was, and this is quoting from the Guardian article, a bed hopping star. In reality, Many castrati were sexualized, particularly those who were stars of the London stage. Rosselli notes, many castrati, especially famous ones, were said to have had affairs with women. Giusto Fer eh, Ferdinando Tenducci married an Anglo-Irish girl of good family who later gave birth to two children. The marriage was eventually annulled at her family's instance. We are used to the sexual feelings that popular singers can arouse. Those least suitable as sexual objects may arouse the strongest feelings. Baroque Europe, no doubt, had its groupies. And I should say uh, the two children that Tenducci's wife had uh, were not Tenducci's, otherwise he would not be a castrato at all. Helen Berry in 2011 actually says this very thing. Um, she published an award-winning book entitled The Castrato and His Wife, which documented the relationship and annulment of Tenducci and his wife, and it draws even more attention to the sexual allure of the castrati. Rautsini was also sexualized in his lifetime, as can be seen in this article from 1776. Signor Rautsini, we are assured, owes his continuance in this kingdom to the interposition of several married ladies of the first rank, who made it a point with the managers of the house that he should positively be engaged, or they would withdraw their subscriptions. It seems many of these illustrious females were enamoured with the semblance of manhood, and to such a pitch of frenzy that they cannot exist without him. But what is still more surprising, some of these lovesick ladies have men for their husbands who as men do honor to their species. These announcements were not unusual during the period and contributed to a wider debate about how Italians, particularly the castrati, were treated in London. As singers, they were hugely popular and were paid enormous fees by the London opera houses. Throughout the period, Many opposed the presence of the castrati, and one of the methods used to defame these singers was to perpetuate rumours they could have a clandestine sexual relationship. Since one of the telltale signs a woman had been unfaithful was pregnancy, a relationship with a castrato perpetuated more fear since she would suffer no such affliction. This is assuming a castrato was even capable of a sexual relationship. Nothing explicit was written about a castrato's ability to have sex during the period, though certain articles certainly implied it was possible. Part of the sexual allure of the castrato was bound in intrigue and mystery. 
This was also the reason why castrati were the subject of gossip, fear, and to a certain extent, xenophobic commentary. And just to add that this is a significant portion of the book project, but I can't get into it explicitly in today's talk. Even Rautzini's former student, Michael Kelly, perpetuated rumours about the castrata's scandalous relationships. In his 1826 reminiscences, he stated, but alas, his beauty was his bane, an exalted personage became deeply and hopelessly enamoured of him, and, spite of his talents, it was suggested to him that a change of air would be for the benefit of his health. He took the hint and left Munich. James Webster suggests we should be sceptical of Kelly's accounts, since many of them are inaccurate at best. In this instance, there is no evidence to support Rauzini's hastened departure from his court position in Munich. As noted by Paul Rice in his 2015 book on Rauzini, the singer may have had a few scandalous encounters with women, but this wasn't unusual for a singer of his status and popularity. This whole account exemplifies the main theme of this talk. Can we trust the sources? Or rather, if we dig deeper into the sources, do they reveal unwritten biases, which can explain why certain pieces of information were continuously cited, but have little evidential grounding? While I have focused the first section on the castrato, the book actually centers on Rautzini and his teaching. I'm using Rautzini as a case study to examine socio-historical attitudes at a point where England was trying to promote a national style of singing, despite the prominence and popularity of the Italian singing style. So why Rautzini? Well, I first became interested in Rautzini after reading his entry in the Grove Book of Opera from 2007. It provides a list of Rautzini's most famous students, who happen to be some of the most celebrated English singers in the latter half of the 18th century. At the time, I wondered if Rautzini had a particular style of training that propelled opera singers into fame, but I slowly realised I was asking all the wrong questions. So this is the list of singers here. And this list of names appears in multiple sources dating all the way back to the early 19th century. Here it is in John Britton's 18, uh, here is John Britton in 1825 listing the same names. And here are the same names again printed in an article from 1810, the year of Rautzini's death. Now, only, uh, only now, Gertrude Mara is separated out from the other singers. And why? In fact, I've tracked this list to six different early 19th century sources, but only one was published in Rautzini's lifetime, and that is The Monthly Mirror from 1807. And this is what it has to say about Rautzini's students. In his career, he has become the father of a new style in English singing and a new race of singers who have naturalised to an English ear the florid and ornamented style of the Italians. His pupils in his class are Madame Mara, Mrs. Billington, and Mr. Braham, whose fame is not confined to this country, and the two former of whom, for science, taste, and execution, are perhaps not excellent by any vocal artist of the present age. Signor Storis and Inkledon, eh, Signora Storis and Inkledon are also pupils of the same master, each possessing a peculiar style of excellence. And lastly, he has afforded, in the example of Mrs. Mountain, a proof of the great advantage of scientific instruction superadded to natural endowments. The Monthly Mirror positions Rautzini as the leading figure of singing teaching in Britain at this time. But why was the article written? It wasn't designed to promote publication. Rautzini's treatise wouldn't actually be published until the following year. And Rautzini doesn't appear to have had any specific ties to the editors of the Monthly Mirror. We could assume it was a truthful, heartfelt promotion of Rautzini's pedagogy, but there are aspects of this uh, highly positive article that make me a little sceptical. 
all of the opera singers listed did have very successful careers, which made it a lot easier to find out specific information about their training. Anna Selina Storis or Storace and John Brum erected a memorial to their former master. So the connection is fairly explicit. I've also found conclusive evidence that Charles Inkledon and Rosamund Mountain were Rautzini's pupils. But when it comes to Elizabeth Billington and Gertrude Mara, who are arguably the most famous names listed on Rautzini's class roster, it's very difficult to find anything conclusive to suggest they were his students. Elizabeth Billington, on the left, was born in London to a musical family and from a young age was considered a musical child prodigy, often accompanying her brother Charles on the piano while he played the violin. Before her 12th birthday, Billington composed and published two sets of keyboard sonatas and three sonatas for violin and piano. Her mother, Friederike Weichsel, was a highly successful singer in her own right, and her father, Karl Friedrich Weichsel, was principal oboist at the King's Theatre. In 1775, at the age of 10, Bellington made her public singing debut in her mother's benefit concert in London. Eight years later, in 1783, she married her singing teacher, James Bellington. Shortly after, the couple moved to Dublin, where she made her operatic debut in the role of Eurydice at Smock Alley Theatre. Billington remained at Smock Alley until 1786, when she came to London as a prima donna at the Theatre Royal Covent Garden. Gertrude Mara, who is on the right, her childhood is remarkably similar to Billington's. Her father was a musician, and from a young age, Mara showed aptitude for the violin. Mara's father took her to Vienna to exhibit his prodigy in 1755 and then to London in 1759. It was here that Mara was advised to take up singing, which was considered a more appropriate musical path for a young woman. From then on, she was billed as a professional vocalist performing all over Europe. Both sopranos performed for Rousini at his Bath concert series, and Mara even stayed with Rousini on a few of her visits. It was certainly possible for her to have lessons with the castrato at this time, but there is little evidence Mara was amiable to engaging in formal lessons, shall we say. And she certainly would not have liked any arrangement to be advertised. Essayists in Britain, Germany and France debated the notion of genius throughout the 18th century with two distinct kinds identified by Joseph Addison. Those exhibiting the first kind of genius stood up as, quote, prodigies of mankind, close quote, and were, quote, without any assistance of art or learning, quote, close quote. This natural genius was complemented by the second kind or the learned genius, those who improved their talents through careful, quote, correction and restraint of art, close quote. Vocal master Pierre Francesco Tosi echoed Addison in his treatise, encouraging his students, quote, only to imitate their professors on condition that it does not bear even so much as a shadow of resemblance of the original, close quote. Mara knew Tosi's work well and claimed to have relied on his treatise for much of her vocal education, as well as performing the works of the great masters of the day. With regards to the training, she had a guitar teacher, two language masters, a dancing master and a coach who worked with her on stage movement, manner and declamation. However, she did not credit a vocal master with her overall training, though she mentioned brief periods in her early career where she had, quote, some vocal lessons, close quote. In her autobiography, Mara claimed to have ended her apprenticeship with the Italian vocal master Pietro Domenico Paradisi after just four weeks, noting the terms of the arrangement were unacceptable. She also denied all claims that Johann Adam Hiller tutored her, stating that she often sang for him in the evenings, but he did not give her vocal instruction. Her statement was in response to a published biography claiming Hiller had been her vocal master, 
though Mara also noted after she returned to Leipzig in 1802, nearly everyone believed that she had studied with him. Though she did not describe herself as a genius, her autobiography emphasized a natural inclination for singing refined through personal study. Her claims aligned with Addison's description of the natural genius, and it's possible Mara avoided lengthy and formalized vocal education specifically with the intent of maintaining her own creative originality. However, as a woman, Mara's implied genius may not have been accepted or even acknowledged. Historian Larry, Sh Larry Shiner has considered the gendering of genius, showing that women could be said to have, quote, have genius for a particular activity, close quote, though these were confined to domestically associated ornamental accomplishments, such as needlework, dancing, singing, or drawing. Women showcasing their talents publicly already defied the accepted social order, though as noted by musicologist Susan Rutherford, by the turn of the 1800s, female opera singers had become accepted addendums to the status quo. However, any implication that a woman was a natural genius may have intruded too far into the male domain. It is not necessarily the case that Mara's contemporary biographers deliberately set out to remove her agency. Rather, it's understandable why they assumed Heller gave her lessons. In 1766, the soprano was a young, inexperienced vocalist in her first leading position in the prominent Grosso concert series led by Hiller. Two years later, Mara had left Leipzig to sing in Italy and Vienna, but Hiller went on to become, according to John Butt, quote, the most notable figure in German music education, close quote. By the time Mara returned to Leipzig, Hiller had successfully founded a music conservatory and had written several manuals on singing. Assuming Mara was his student was both logical and compelling, even if the soprano claimed it to be untrue. Credit given to Rauzzini, however, is much more difficult to justify. Mara had already established a well-regarded reputation, both in Britain and on the continent. Meanwhile, Rauzzini's teaching reputation was slowly building, only reaching its peak around 1807-08, with the publication of the Monthly Mirror article. There is also no evidence Mara's voice improved or changed after performing with Rauzzini, with many reviews of her singing inconsistent throughout her career. Here are two reviews, the first from 1786 that says, Madame Mara was, as she generally is, forcible, pathetic and expressive, particularly in that divine air, I know that my Redeemer liveth, which she sang with true energy and pathos. And then in 1793, Madame Mara will sing that sublime air of Lord Remember David, which for true harmony and expression cannot fail of pleasing the audience as they will have an opportunity of witnessing her powers in the pathetic as well as the executive style. Now, if you think that these are very positive and show her to be an exemplary singer, well, uh, a review from, uh, from 1785 says to the contrary. Handel's pathetic English airs will only serve to portray Mara's defects. Now, I've presented these to show that this is before she had worked with Rauzzini and after she had worked with Rauzzini. So there's no definitive change in how she is being reviewed. While it is possible Mara benefited from Rauzzini's expertise, there's little evidence she had formal lessons with him. It is likely then the Monthly Mirror used Mara's name to elevate Rauzzini's status as a noteworthy master with publications repeating the same claim thereafter. But why make the statement at all? It's possible Billington was indirectly responsible for Mara being listed as a pupil of Rauzzini. These two sopranos were so often compared to one another, so much so one could easily have assumed they shared the same vocal master. In 1788, a reviewer noted, nature has gifted Mrs. Billington with sweet and powerful tones, and she is skillful and modest in the use of them, except the Mara, 
the Alleganti and the Merchetti, there is no better singer in Europe. Similar comments were made in 1790, where a viewer said in the bravura song, in the second act, the audience were surprised and delighted to fight in finding Mrs. W, second to no English opera singer in taste and skill, Mara, Billington and Storis accepted. And then in 1791, this being Mrs. Billington's first appearance since the last season, she was fainted with very cordial applause and the repaid it by the ex execution of three airs in a style which she alone after Mara can give. A public rivalry, which was most likely staged, challenged the two sopranos to perform the same role in the same opera on the same night, with the audience invited to judge the better of the two. This event showcased the similarity in vocal ability and style between Billington and Mara, though there was little consensus as to who the winner of the contest had been. After this stunt, Billington and Mara showed no animosity toward one another and even performed together at Mara's final concert, uh, singing the Grand Duet, a piece composed specifically for them by Mara's lover, Charles Florio. The similarity between the vocal parts further emphasized their likeness, particularly the lengthy bravura passages. There was one fundamental difference between these two sopranos. While Mara frequently denied claims she was trained by particular teachers, Billington did not. First of all, it was known Billington had married her vocal master. Secondly, critics frequently referred to improvements in her singing as the direct result of additional vocal education, as we can see in this quote from 1786. Who at Paris is to have the, whole di uh, the sole direction of Mrs. Billington in her further professional studies? And it was referencing Sacchini there. Engaging in lessons with Rossini was both plausible and did not jar with Billington's public perception. She knew the castrato well and often appeared at his Bath concert series. Michael Kelly even noted the following. I have known Mrs. Billington renounce many profitable engagements in London when Rossini has required the aid of her talents and at her own expense travel to Bath and back to London as fast as four horses could carry her without accepting the most trifling remuneration. While the statement overly romanticizes Billington running to the castrato's aid, it perhaps symbolizes the type of behavior Rossini elicited in his professional colleagues. He rarely paid his star performers up front, and instead these singers depended on a benefit evening for their fee. Unfortunately, like Mara, there's no explicit evidence other than the Monthly Mirror article Rossini and Billington had a formal arrangement, but it is perhaps more likely Billington was receptive to Rossini's guidance. In fact, she recommended Elizabeth Clendinning have lessons with Rossini and even provided her, quote, with a few letters of introduction and a liberal proof of her regard by way of a recommendation so that he would take her on as a student. In conclusion, even though there's no direct evidence Billington, and uh, Billington was Rautzini's student, there is a lot more circumstantial evidence to support the claim. Mara, on the other hand, is much more difficult to prove. It's more likely Mara's connection to the castrato was at best an inaccurate assumption on, based on her frequent comparison to Billington and her regular performances at Bath. At worst, the Monthly Mirror were deliberately using Mara's fame to promote Rossini's work, a scenario that played out so often in The Sopranos' career. Thank you very much. Brianna, thank you. I'm sure we're all extending a, a virtual or even a real round of applause from afar. I uh, really enjoyed that. Lots of sauce and spice there for us to get stuck into. And, uh, Maybe lots of things for us to draw out as well. Just while we're um, while we're while our audience are maybe formulating questions of them for themselves, I wonder if I could invoke chair's privilege and <clears throat> and ask you the first question. Um, I, f I kind of felt a little bit sorry for Alzini as you were speaking. I mean, there was not only the the did he didn't he was he wasn't he question of his intactness, shall we say? Um, 
but kind of more more uh, more intellectually than that was the question of the weak evidence around him being the teacher of these two sopranos and I, I just wondered if there was weak evidence generally for him having a real influence on on singing pedagogy of that time you know were there any were there any students of his who were really of the first rank who are really influential singers uh, yes. So um, while Billington and Marr are perhaps the most famous who are connected to him, um, one of his students that was absolutely his student, and we know this for a fact, uh, was John Braham, who became a celebrated English singer uh, at the end of the 18th century and even travelled and did an American tour. So he had achieved international fame as well as, as national, well, was across Britain frame and um, because he did a tour throughout, uh, throughout Britain um, and we know that he was his student because he actually came to Routzini a little bit later it was highly advertised that um, he was a pupil of Routzini so this appears in newspapers of the time and he lived with Routzini for about two years so it looks more like an apprenticeship kind of uh, arrangement that they had and um, even though that doesn't quite work either because Routzini would pay him to come and perform at concerts and uh, and advertise himself as Braham's patron at times. So it, he seems to have been a supporter of his students in a way that other teachers just weren't at the time um, and a supporter financially as well as promoting them through their opportunities to perform and through supporting their studies as well. Um, other students that can credit uh, that credit Routzini as uh, being their teacher is Anna Selina Storis, who goes on to become Mozart's first uh, Susanna, and she trains with Routzini at a relatively young age. So between she's ten when she first comes under his instruction, and then she's twelve by the time she actually goes to Italy and starts to achieve uh, fame there in her own right. Uh, we also have Rosamund Mountain, who became a very famous English singer and um, didn't perform internationally, but did perform in England. Um, and there are several other singers that I'm coming across all the time that did have some kind of informal really, informal lessons with Routzini because they'll be quoted as his pupil um, for a few concerts and then those quotes disappear very shortly afterwards. So there's questions there as to whether they're using Routzini again to promote themselves as a kind of, in a kind of way to get attention, or if they are actually receiving some kind of instruction from the Castrato. So when you when you put it like that, actually the evidence stacks up very favourably for Routzini yes. for the sounds of things, um, and he clearly had an eye for marketing. Um, Definitely, he, yes. <laughs> He said himself very well. Now, ever since I've been teaching in higher education now in the contemporary world, um, there's always been talk about, oh, the creep of marketization, you know, having to sell ourselves as, as excellent educators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it seems that was nothing new, actually. That's nothing new either. That was going on in the late 18th century. I wonder if you could say a little bit about particularly the marketization. Uh, yes, definitely. So uh, Routzini is actually quite conservative compared to some other teachers during the period. And um, so his, his friend and colleague Domenico Cori, he publishes a four volume, extremely expensive set of treatises that says that not only is he the greatest teacher in all of Britain, um, but that he's devised a new method to make teaching easier for the inexperienced people. So, so there's claims being made kind of left, right and centre by certain pedagogues and Jezuel de Lanza similarly um, promotes himself as uh, inventing a new method of teaching that is going to um, revolutionise how singers perform and uh, his, his method is actually also kind of promoting that you don't need a master to come into your house which is something that was feared at the, at the end of the 18th century of um, whether you have a a man coming into the home and, and educating your young daughter. That was uh, of great debate during this time. Could just do it um, online. So, sorry, just do it yeah. online. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Routzini, I mean, certainly what he's doing is he is constantly using his uh, pupils as singers in the concert. And this obviously has a two way effect because if he's putting his people on stage and they are deemed to be of good enough quality mm. to perform professionally, then what's going to happen is that he's going to get 
good feedback back on his teaching. But equally, they are getting professional experience, which is arguably much more valuable than sitting in any kind of room practicing exercises up a left, right and center. So this seems to be the method that Rousini uses throughout his career to promote himself as a pedagogue and to promote his students. Um, and it's one of the main arguments that I'm positioning in my book because he's one of the He's one of the last of the Italian masters to use this method before we get on to much more um, book-based learning. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've held the floor long enough, I feel. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in as well. Brianna, you could probably open the Q&A tab now actually and see them too. Oh, yes. Uh, Tim's got a question. I don't know, Tim, if you're connected up to a microphone and you can, you can say your question and say hello too. I'm just going to press allow to talk if you are there. I wonder if you can come in. If not, Tim, oh, don't worry. Hello. hello. I, didn't oh, know, hi, I didn't know this was a possibility. Yes, I um, thought that'd be rather nice. You go yeah. ahead. I was just wondering about those, um, the kind of staged managed uh, performance that the, the two sopranos did where they were kind of competing with each other um, uh, to be the best at the role. And just wondering yeah. if that was kind of really common at the time and whether that happened earlier. Um, it just really reminded me of the kind of turntablism of hip hop music. And, and that kind of competitiveness, uh, which was kind of interesting. Uh, yes, so um, the, the rival singers was something that had been happening since the beginning of the 18th century. Um, there were two rival sopranos in Handel's Opera House, uh, who actually I showed images of, that was um, Cuzzoni and Bordoni, uh, who both uh, ended up having a massive argument on stage one night and apparently one pulled the wig off of the other. Um, but it's been highly speculated um, by Suzanne Aspen uh, whether this too was a staged performance because they seemed to be able to just go back on stage the next night and everything was fine. And, uh, but, you know, obviously you got a lot more audiences coming in um, because they want to see the two sopranos kick off again. So uh, that's happening at the beginning of the 18th century. And there was this kind of um, effort for newspapers to get behind one soprano or the other, or indeed two rival castrati was the other way of dealing with it. So Mara and Billington are no exception to this kind of rule. In fact, Mara had several rivalries with other singers um, throughout her career. So before, um, before Billington, she was a rival of Toady, um, who was a Spanish singer, and uh, they, um, they had like the, the two different sides um, competing as to whether they were Toadyists or Marists. Um, so Mara seems to have been, as a star soprano, kind of one to get quite a lot of rival rivals to her singing. And it's probably because she is a dramatic soprano who's really excelling this bravura style. And so as the younger soprano is coming up, she's also trying to exhibit her talents in the bravura style and they're using this to play off of one another. Great, thanks Brianna. Uh, we've got another question here from Jess and again I'll just give Jess a chance to come in if she wants to but not a problem if not at all um, and the question is the question is is there any evidence involving other female singers to suggest that this was a common theme to deny teaching was this frowned upon during the time period rather than being known as a prodigy uh, so what's um, what's interesting about this time period is that there are there are a lot of female singers before the age of fourteen who are considered child prodigies, and the reason why that age is particularly important is because before you were fourteen years old, you were not considered an adult; you were still a child. And um, after the age of fourteen, you were then an adult, and there's a, a lot less. Um, evidence of women being promoted as as prodigies or as um, uh, as kind of, a, um, I'm trying to think of a word, uh, as kind of a really exceptional or exceptional natural geniuses. In fact, uh, to the contrary, often women are associated with a particular teacher. And I think this is where we get this idea that you have to have some kind of pedigree um, to show your skill set. I think this has been perpetuated at the end of the 18th century and it's to try and show your prowess as a performer. Um, but obviously at this time as we're getting this idea of 
the natural genius or the learned genius, which is really being debated and heavily debated in coffee houses at this time, um, women who are talented in their own right and who are already defying um, the, the laws of public decorum because they are performing publicly, um, they are really walking a, a tricky ground if they are to suggest in any kind of way that they are a natural genius. And this is probably why Billington isn't really policing any claims made about whether she is being taught by certain people or not. And in fact, she can't, she can't police those claims anyway because she marries her music master. And that's, that's very well known at, by the time she's publicly performing. Mara, on the other hand, uh, she is really being uh, careful to promote herself as a particular kind of musician and hold on to this prodigy status. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even work to her favor um, where she's torn down as someone who is ill-educated and doesn't understand the decorum of the stage. Um, so that's uh, another thing I wasn't able to bring in tonight, um, but it's another feature of the chapter where it's showing that she's almost pulled down um, because she's not showcasing her musical pedigree, as it were. Great, thanks Brianna. Uh, I've got a question here from Miriam, stemming from the Bernie family journals, a bit of a favourite of mine oh. at that period. Again, I'll just let Miriam come in if she wishes to, not a problem if not. No, uh, and the question is, let's have a look. Uh, Bernie family journals are peppered with the tensions associated with famous castrato performers and with the complex problems of reputation for female singers. Was there more sexual charge with castrato performances than others? How did women's reactions differ? Um, well, certainly in the case of Rossini, uh, when he arrives in London, um, Susan Burney is particularly thrilled to see uh, that he is going to come and perform on the stage. Or, Fra sorry, Francis Burney is particularly thrilled to, to hear that he's going to come and perform. Um, and then his first performance is actually a bit of a letdown because he has a cold and apparently he's, he's not able to perform as he might have expected. Um, but thereafter, uh, he gets a lot of you know, reading the, some of the letters and diary entries that I've read, it's almost like fangirls really lusting over um, his abilities and him as a person that they describe him as um, an angel, as, a, as someone who um, is very attractive and very charismatic. Uh, so it's these features of Rossini that are being lusted over. Um, more so that they don't really tend to describe his figure or his, you know, his physical person or anything like that. It's more about his, um, his charismatic persona. Um, other castrati, so Guardani um, was also highly last, lusted over during the period and Tinducci as well. Um, and some of the castrati actually perpetuated certain rumours about themselves and, and certain mysteries about themselves. So Tinducci famously said that um, he, they only castrated, they, they only took half of him away and that um, he had a hidden testicle and the, that's how he was able to father his wife's children. And this, this is of course completely rubbish because he couldn't have been a castrato if that was the case. Um, so part of their allure is the fact that uh, nobody really knows and, and no one's explicitly saying anything about them and certainly no one's doing any kind of examination about what they can and cannot do in that respect. Um, so it's more about the not knowing rather than you know, them being explicit about what they can and cannot do, if that makes sense. It does, and, and there, aren't, there aren't ever any kind of naughty stories about examinations upon the death of these people to actually find out, is there? None of that kind no. of... Not, not, that I, not that I've come across yet, no. <laughs> I know that they exhumed Farinelli recently, but he was, he was only bones, and um, again, like evidence up there seems to have been inconclusive and wasn't published or hasn't been published yet. Yeah, yeah. And if it did happen, it probably would have ended up in the, in the Bernie Journal, so, you know, there probably we go. Probably yet. <laughs> Okay, wonderful, Brianna, thank you very much. Um, that was a very entertaining, informative, educative talk, very enjoyable. Um, just before we go, um, I'd like to do a couple of parish notices, please, beyond us saying thank you once again to Brianna, uh, and thank you as well to Louisa, who provided the captioning this evening too. Thank you, everybody, for coming along, very much appreciated. And I want to remind you of the next exchange talk, 
which is this time next week, just in one week's time, uh, when it's Ben Redmond speaking, a PhD candidate, and he'll be speaking about the low latency video conferencing system uh, for music teaching that I know many of uh, you colleagues who are with us tonight have, uh, have investigated and are using too. For more information on that, just visit rcs.ac.uk forward slash exchange hyphen talks. Uh, and you can follow the research and knowledge exchange team on Twitter as well, of course, at rcs underscore the exchange. So I'm sure we will see many of you again next week for Ben's talk. But for now, thank you, Brianna, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.